We're good. All right. So far, what's happened is we just uh, started the the Pelican software, which is the descendant of. Um, Beowulf. All right. The, uh, the cluster you mentioned earlier. The yeah, Beowulf. Beowulf cluster. Okay. This is where, it, if you went to look up Beowulf cluster, you got redirected to Pelican. Pelican. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I initially tried doing this with other networking. And, referred to as HPC, for High Performance Computing Clusters. I couldn't get it to work, and I didn't understand why. I finally realized uh, that I needed to create thin clients. Now, what a thin client basically is, is a PC with no hard drive. Uh, it can actually have no CD-ROM. It just basically boots up uh, off the network. And it's just oh, a net PC. Okay, and it's a server that just basically throws the operating system right. to all of these other units. So you don't need all of this stuff. However, with older machines, you'd have to sometimes reprogram the chip in order to get it to work. Well, there's a workaround. There's a disk called iPixie, which I discovered. And you boot off of that, and it creates a thin client. So the first is the front end. The front end has to have all the operating stuff system on it. And this is what's booting right now is the Pelican's front end. Once we get that going, then we're going to start booting off all of the systems and see how many of these units we can get. I've never gotten all eight of them. It's usually seven and there's some little problem or something and, and it delays. So we'll see how many we can get up. Uh, but at this point, these are all single core units. They're all upgraded to... Uh, Gigabit networking, there's a gigabit networking switch that's in it, there's the 8 port KVM so that we can demonstrate what's supposed to happen. Now ideally, let's say you had a classroom environment, you would go around through these iPixie disks in all the machines, and then the main system can be used to serve the operating system to all of those. And your 30 unit classroom becomes a 30 unit cluster, which then you can use to do some real work. This is similar, it's only eight. I uh, started thinking about power consumption and realized if I wanted to go to 16, assuming I had 16 PCs, which I didn't have, but assuming I had 16 PCs at 100 watts a piece, uh, that would be s roughly 16 amps, which is more than a typical 15 amp outlet can handle. So 8 seemed to be the logical. If they were a little more, 120 watts a piece, that would make it exactly... You had a limit. Yeah, there's a limit. Okay, you've got to think about Cooling also has a problem. Uh, you can mount all of these up on a rack, okay? Just take the PCs and get one of those Baker's type racks and just mount them, just stack them up on that. But you gotta worry about cooling, you gotta worry about power consumption, you gotta worry about weight when you start getting into more than, oh, you know, a handful of PCs. 16 PCs weigh half a ton. So, <laughs> so I needed to get the weight of this down for the transport. I also wanted the network all three set up so that we wouldn't have to be plugging all these cables in and making the network wherever the demo was going to happen. So everything is in the box. It's basically the only things that are sticking out are the CD-ROMs, the start buttons, and the, uh, uh, the KVM and the network switch so we can see what's going on. But is, all right. is eight in here? There are eight PCs in there, varying types. Uh, ideally, with uh, uh, a network like this, you prefer to have all the PCs being exactly the same, so they're able to process all the jobs simultaneously. The same, the whole finish almost at the same moment. So you break the job up evenly; it will then do them do the pieces evenly. The only one that can be different is the front end, which you want to have more capabilities than all the nodes, because it's got to be a little faster. It's got more to do. Uh, while we're waiting, oh, we're, we're almost ready. Uh, one of the things we should discuss is a thing called Amidal's Law. Now, first of all, Moore's Law, that doubling performance every, uh, every uh, 18 months, it's dead. It's dead. gone. Gone. Okay, because they can't go, <clears throat> they've gotten to 5 megahertz processing speed. And what they used to do is just double the processing speed, and you would get double the capabilities. Well, they've reached the limit because of quantum mechanics. They can only go to about 5 megahertz. And they're just about there now. And it's taken them three years to go from, or four years to go from four megahertz to a five megahertz point. So Moore's Law has, is dead. So in order to get around that, they are now putting more processors in the machine. So that when you have 
more threads, you get a job that's multi-threaded, those extra cores will then take those jobs and that's referred to as embarrassingly parallel. You can set this job and this job and this job. One of the big problems today is nobody's written any really good software right, yeah, no, to take jobs and parallelize them to run them. This is really an open area for people. This is a cutting edge spot in this. I heard that. Yeah. Okay. It's it's amazing. Uh, uh pack one quick minute. Is there when you're talking about that where they put in more and more force, is there I I did my tour my son to get really into the thing. Is there a law of managing returns in the sense? Yes, that let's talk about that for a second. Uh, let's use an example that I read. <clears throat> you've got a lawn to mow. Okay, it's a certain size. You've got a riding lawnmower. You need to do the outside with a real mower. So you've got to go around the outside. That's the prep work. So let's say that takes you 20 minutes. And let's say the riding part of the job takes you 40 minutes. Okay, well the riding part is the only part you can really parallelize. Because the prep part is prep. So you call 10 friends. You know, nine friends. So there are ten people now on riding lawnmowers. So instead of taking 40 minutes to do the center section, it should only take four. Great. Okay. So we now cut the job down from an hour to 24 minutes. That's a definite improvement. So you go, oh, this is great. Now let me let me call 40 friends, and each one will do a minute's worth of work, and we'll get it done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you still have to tell each of your friends what section of the lawn do you want them to mow, which takes a minute. So you start, in the, in the first case when you had uh, 10 guys come over, it actually takes you another 10 minutes. So it's actually not 24 minutes, but 34 minutes. Definitely a gain in performance, uh, but when you add that many more cores, and you've got 40 guys there, now it takes you 40 minutes just to tell them what to do, the 40 minutes that you could have done the job by yourself. So some of this stuff that's being done in universities is being done still on single cores, because they don't know exactly how to break them up and so on. Some jobs are beautifully done. Some are very complex, like the weather predictions. They have to look at what happens here and then how that affects the ones around it and then how that affects the others. So mm -hmm. having multiple cores look at these other guys and get that little piece of information, okay, this is what's happened in this, this unit time. To me, you can adjust your numbers that way. And that's how these weather predictions are getting so good, is, mm -hmm. is parallelism. Sounds like the game of life. It's it's well, it's life it's is parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that you it. you are sitting here listening to me, this is a parallel process because there's you and you and you, you know. And I'm conveying what I know, but I don't have to say it three times serially once to you, once to you, and once to you. It's all at once. Right. Okay, we get to this point. This is uh, Pelican. It comes up after you hit the enter key for the first time. You get this screen, and it says RAM one. Now what RAM 1 is something that if you've got a hard drive, you can put an HDA1 and whatever you've stored will come back. That's not an issue for us here, we're just demonstrating how the software works. There's no hard drives in this, so we're going to run it right off the CD. So I don't do anything with this. Excuse me, let me get past you here a second. I'll get to the keyboard. Okay. So I just click OK on this. All right, and it says user configuration, an example, home users, you probably choose yes. So yes, we need to choose yes because there's nothing set up. And then, and then it goes through and sets up some stuff, examples for the <coughs> economic software that this particular guy was working with, the one who created, he improved on the Beowulf cluster to create Pelican. There's tutorials in this as well. You can see MPI starts floating back. Uh yeah, uh, you're seeing this, right? This right. is all for one machine? It's all for one machine so far. This so is the, the other ones haven't been started yet? No, no. no. Okay. You'll as see how that works in a second. As far as the, the Pelican software, is there like a site that supports that, downloads Yes, for right it? now, but it's going to go away probably within the next six months. You need to get on there and get everything that's possible. Okay, if you do a search on Beowulf, you'll probably be redirected to Pelican. Best to go directly to the Pelican site. So that Why that, is that going to disappear? because the guy's not going to support it. He's reached a point where this is basically uh, <coughs> Debian or Debian. And it, it's already gone to the next level. It's gone from whatever version now to another version, a newer version, and he's not updating it. 
Okay. So anybody can actually. And he's actually said, "You want to update this? You know, I'll, I'll give you the scripts or whatever you need, and you can update it. But I'm not going to take the time to do it. I need to get back to doing real work." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's understandable. But look what he did. You know. Okay. okay. Now I've eliminated the password on the on the monitor, so that all I got to do is hit enter. Once I go to enter the password, it's going to ask for a password. So I've eliminated everything and just hit enter. Now we get this part. And it wants to log in. Well, gee, you know, I'm the only user. What do you think my username is? It's user. <laughs> it right out there, user. So you're told it's a, never to do that. This is what, well, remember, this is supposed to be an independent system. You are not to be hooking this up on the internet. Right. Okay, this has to be separate. Uh, it does uh, DHCP, it does IP address handouts, and of course, your ISP wouldn't like what they're seeing coming from your location. So, you so this is good if you buy a nuclear bunker that's been decommissioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or somebody's cottage. That, that <laughs> okay, so we hit user and enter. We hit the password. Well, gee, I just made it their enter key, so we'll hit it again. Now we get a prompt. Now we can get, a, get to business here. P-E-L-I-C-A-N underscore setup. And if you're not sure, it's right there on the screen. Create a post <laughs> type Pelican setup. So I just type that, and away we go. And now we're creating a cluster. Now it's going to tell you this is going to destroy uh, if there's any other cluster running on, the, on these machines. You're going to blow it away by doing this. Okay. So do not permit if, it, if your cluster is on an existing network or Pelican HPC DHC server may conflict with a running DHCP service. Okay. You don't want to interrupt anything else, but since this is my system, we know nobody else is there. So we hit it, hit yes and let it run. In a few seconds, we'll get another one of those colorful gray windows. Time to bring the computer nodes into the cluster. If you're sizing and running cluster, be aware that continuing will interrupt uh, running MPI jobs. So if there's an MPI job running right now, this is to warn you, you're going to clobber it. But we don't care, because we've got nothing going. So we hit yes again, it then checks, and now it's time to turn on the nodes. So we're ready to start firing things up. So for this system, I took the cheap way out, because it was getting more and more expensive the more I did this. Forgive me. That, that fan feels good. Do you think you'll believe it there? No. I know, I know. You don't fit in that. It's only going to... What are you doing now? Uh, I've got... I put two outlets in here. And I've got all the clusters on these little three-way doodads. And I've got to see if I can get them plugged, all plugged into these. It would have been better if I put switches up, but you can't have everything. Okay, now I've added power to all the clusters. Let's get you know this what you thing. need in stuff like this? You need a central, small central process, uh, PC to, yeah. to have them go out to all the other ones and then so you can pick one and do all exactly, the other Exactly, exactly. How am I going to transport something oh, like that? Well, yeah, well, no, but I'm just saying it's a small one. You don't have to have like a laptop. Okay. Now, 5 is the one that I've got that's the most powerful out of the group. 5 is the one that is the front end. The rest of the 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, six, seven, and eight are not. Now you see some of them have lit up, and maybe may have started booting, but maybe not. That's what the push buttons are for. One of them may not work, and I may have to open this. Okay, so let's go to two. Two, three, four. That's firing up. Let's go to three. One, two, three, four. Hopefully that will fire up. Three may, uh, I may have to do three differently. That's one of the ones I've had a problem with. Here's four. Four already started firing up on its own. Now some of these old machines need keystrokes like F1 and that sort of thing to, uh, to continue on. And I may even have to go into the setup on this one. The date looks good. No, it doesn't. So that means the battery went down on this one. Uh. Okay, uh, this is October. Okay. 
that's, and this is the thing that's bad about this stuff, is For all practical purposes, you're setting the BIOS, so you could set it to 2023. 20, right. I mean, but it's going to be changed because it, it knows what the uh, initial date is okay. and it checks to see if it's a match, which makes this a problem. Okay. So you've got to change the date on some of these. Now, let's see if it'll run this time or if now it's still the, there's still something else that doesn't run. Uh, let's look at the boot sequence. Fingers crossed. There's a Pending 4. These are all different types. There's a couple of Pending 4s, uh, the Celeron. Oh, you know what it might be? It's one of these doesn't have a disk in it. But you couldn't get it open. I can't remember which one it was now. with the drive, or it could be got disconnected. All right, let's just continue on here. Okay, that was four. Let's hit six. Okay. Go. Like something I did. Let's go to seven. Somebody's complaining. I think the memory might have shaken loose when we tried yes. to get this beast in here. <laughs> shaken loose in the drive or the library. Okay, that's eight. That's coming up. Seven. Okay. Three is a problem, right? Have you had this all going as well? No, I've never had all of them running at the same time. So this is a, I mean, this happens every so often? Yep, this happens every time I try to run it. There's something weird goes on. We're going to try to get three to run. I'm going to cheat. Okay, three is this guy right here. Parents? Thank you. It's just, just a magic moment here with the uh, yeah, magic moment. <laughs> the latch has been unhinged and the cows can come home. They're used to that from where I'm at, you know. I got guy drive down the block, just you know, I leave the block and I go left and I go around the, the street and there's a guy at five o'clock in the afternoon and he's moving the cows from one field over to the, the barn. Okay, let's take a look again. Now, by this point, a few of these may get ready. Let's try to do this one. Uh, that's good. Time is, yeah, that's close enough. Let's try this guy. Just let me know if anybody wants more water. As this thing heats up the cottage. Yeah, you feel it. <laughs> All right, let's 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 move on then. It's not necessary. Okay, let's see what we got. Eight. Let's see. Okay. 
Yeah, see, it takes something on this one. Batteries. I put two batteries in these already. I thought we were all good. That's another thing that may have been affected by the drill. Let's see if this one boots up now. This is a three. This is the slowest one. It's only 600 megahertz. I think they're uh, 700 megahertz. They may be 600 down here. Okay, well, we know it's not going to find a floppy drive. Alright, let's get back to this. There's number one. Oh, that's still not good. Uh, and number two. One of these is going to show the here, okay. Here is the correct screen that you're supposed to get once you've got that node running. It'll put this thing on there and it says this is a Pelican PC computer node as part of a cluster. And it's doing some really important stuff. That's to scare, you know, student away and so on and tell them to go to the teacher. Right. Okay, and then just leave this one alone. Okay, that was two. That's coming up now. Let's try to see with this one. That's six, two, three, four, five, six. It sees the CD-ROM on this one, so... All right, let's see how many we got at this point. We got one. No, it's not ready. Okay, don't go. Uh, two we got. Three we got. Four, we'll let it be, no, that's not going to work. Uh, six. I had seven of these here, but I figured if we had two of them running, that would give us enough. Um, let's get this one more short. It's hard to tell. I forget all the time which keys are going to hit. Delete. device to be a CD. Uh, how do we change this? Uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. It starts booting at a good time, but if it doesn't, we're going to move on. We got two up anyway. We got uh, number two and I think three are already. Uh, four doesn't have anything. Six, nothing. Seven, nothing. We got two, so that's what we should see now. Let's do it. Alright, this is back to the software. It says turn, turn on your notes. The first thing you should do is just hit enter. And what it'll do is it'll go through and look for the nodes this time. And it found two. 
because we got two running. Okay, now if we say yes at this point, it will create the cluster out of the three machines. And it will indicate that we've got three nodes total. There it is, three nodes. Okay, we could have as many as eight, but we didn't even do that. Okay, so we click OK at this point. Give it a moment. What it's doing now is it's actually talking to these other guys, asking it, okay, I got a job I want you to run and return the report to me, the results to me. Okay, cluster number zero is the, is the front end. Okay, and that's 330 megaflops. Two is 459, and, uh, one was 459, and the third, the second one was 331. So we've got four of them together with almost a uh, thousand megaflops, which would be one gigaflop. This thing has gotten as close to two gigaflops, which is Cray two level. So not Cray-1, not Cray-XMP, but the third machine that they had come up with. And that's not bad considering it's just three PCs thrown together. And with eight, like it's well, the eight PCs, with eight we do a lot better. And of course you can divide up the job, but it tells you how fast the calculation speeds were and so on. So this is actually, I'm pretty sure this is a LINPAC test. What? It's called a LINPAC test. Okay. I don't know that. I'm going off the mm -hmm. i got to put this back up. Mm -hmm. uh, as, <sighs> As in AT&T. Orientation is important. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> currently, the fastest machine on the planet is in China. Unfortunately. Yeah, um, as a national university of defense technology, the number of cores they have is 3,120,000 cores. The number second fastest machine is in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And it's a Cray system. It only has about a half a million processors, but it's half the machine of the half the uh, speed of the Chinese machine. It's about 16. Uh, what's the term? Petaflops. Petaflops. A petaflop is one times ten to the fifteenth. So that's one followed by fifteen zeros. Yeah. Uh, and then there's 33 of those for the for the uh, Chinese machine, and 16 for the one in Oak Ridge. The number three machine is, uh, I think, in Lawrence Livermore Labs, and that one has one and a half million cores in it. It's actually more like the Chinese machine in its setup. Uh, and then they go down from there. But uh, there's a list at the top500.org. You can download a spreadsheet, it'll tell you what type of hardware there is. I said to Jim, well, technically, some of this could be considered cutting edge. He says, well, no, no, gig gigabit networking is not cutting edge. And it's like, yeah, but if you look at the list, it's like the 60th machine is still using gigabit networking. The top ones above that are using uh, two different types of uh, uh, networking, and I can't. One of them is cable, okay, and it's rated at 10 gigabit speeds. A 50-foot cable, I'm trying to remember the name of it, is about 50 some odd dollars. It's a buck a foot, where I could buy one of these cables for a dollar or two, or a six foot. So they're very expensive, I'm trying to remember what they call that. And then above that is optical. Now one of my favorite stories going back to I think it's 2004 or three, was one group spent, I think it was five million dollars. Now the, the top machine on the planet was half a gig, half a, half a billion dollars. And uh, the second one was a quarter of a billion dollars. And this group had spent five million dollars. And they bought Mac G5s, which were brand new at the time. They networked them together optically. They used a new custom type of cooling and something else. There was four things that they had put in. And they were, they just wanted to get on the list. They were, please, let's get on the list. They came to number three. <laughs> something that they didn't expect was going to happen happened. They started getting phone calls. We'd like to buy time on your supercomputer. Okay, uh, so that's pretty much it with the demo. I'm not going to go any further than that. But at this point, this is uh, actually we do one more thing.
Everybody knows Start X, I hope. That is the graphical interface for uh, uh, Debian Live, which is similar to Nopix. And of course, I don't have a mouse plugged in, so I'm not going to do anything with this. But you can get in here and you can try his um, accounting, uh, his uh, predictive software that he's set up for uh, uh, finance uh, is on here. Now, there are more than the more types of HPC uh, clusters, as you can see, this is almost up. Okay, and then here you can get into the stuff and run it if you wish. But we're going to shut it down at this point because I don't want to waste any more John's electricity. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to call you up when you get to tell when you get to the, uh, <laughs> tell them. If, if your bill goes up $50, you let me know. Okay. Uh, I think we're all shut down. I mean, this, this has possibilities. I mean, Okay, like I said, this is not the way to do this. The best way to do this is get yourself a baker's rack and just stack the PCs up one next to another, right. run the networking cables to the uh, network switch. You don't, if, if you can get them to boot up the same way, then you can use a set, set of keystrokes to get each and every one of them started so you won't need a KVM. And then you can just run the Pelican thing to see if the node came up or not. And then go to the next one and go to the next one and go to the next one until it's finished. Uh, but this is only one of half a dozen of these Linux distros. And the way to find all of them is to do a search for Linux HPC, High Performance Computing. Uh, there was one I looked at, now I looked at a few before I came to this one and finally got success, uh, but there was one that was based on a current version of Ubuntu, which is good because that means they're using the latest kernel. It's bad because it's only in Spanish. Can't use it unless you start learning Spanish. Um, there's another one uh, called Quantian, and Quantian has a lot of this uh, computational type software from various groups, including the, the type that he's got, plus things uh, using R, which is a MATLAB clone, and a whole bunch of others. And I never tried it, but supposedly, obviously, you get the, the nodes ready, you should be able to put this thing and boot it up and have it all connect. Uh, it's it's the future. There is no other way around it. This is where we're going because they can't speed the stuff yeah, yeah, up, yeah, yeah. and the serial software is only going to take us so far, so fast. Uh, most of our eleven universities, I think all of them, uh, the places like uh, Brookhaven Labs and Oak Ridge Labs and and uh, and so on. Lawrence Livermore Labs, they're all doing this. Argon is a big one that's been pumping out software. You so, have to. Yeah, there's no other way at this point to get The companies are looking into it, but nobody's come out with anything other than um, the simplistic type where you've got a piece of software that uses multiple threads or you're running multiple applications, so you're using multiple threads, and right. they can farm those off to the other cores. But most of these machines it's one or two or three cores is all you're using, even though you may have an eight-core system. You need uh, MPI, Message Passing Interface, which this thing offers. And there's a new version of MPI called MPI4, which encompasses everything, okay? One of the things that they did in Tennessee in order to get their machine, and they were, before the Chinese came up with their results, a year ago they were at the top of the list, the one in Tennessee. And what they did was, they're, they're using motherboards, Intel motherboards. Well, they had room to put graphical uh, processing units, which they're basically video cards that have been converted to become cores. And they upgraded their machine for... Well, using, they're using the, video, using the, 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 the graphics cores to... to, 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 to process data. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim had talked about this yeah, in the yeah, past, yeah. and he thought we should get into it. But uh, at this point, it's a moot point. Yeah. You can get into it with MPI-4. Or that uh, mm -hmm. the outfit with um, uh, searching for alien life and things like that. SETI. Set. Why can't you remember that? Yeah. yeah. I'm getting older. So SETI, said uh, you can have an option if you to to certain uh, graphic cards. If you have it in your machine, it'll also use that. Yeah. Well, like mm -hmm. I said, the MPI four covers all of it. You have whatever configuration or arrangement there is. MPI four is covering it. Problem with MPI-4 is there's only two ways to program it. 
One is Fortran. And how many people you know are currently uh, using Fortran? The other way is C and C++, which is active. C++ so, is okay. Yeah. So uh, MPI handles both of those environments. And uh, so it's just somebody has to figure out a way and see to get these cores to be utilized better and the machines that we've got will start to really hum. But right now they're not going to. They're going to start coming out. There's eight core machines you can buy over at uh, um, that computer place near you. What the hell's the name of it? Micro oh, Center. Micro Center. Micro Center. Yeah. Okay? You can buy eight core motherboards. So obviously I started this before those came out. They were only you know four core. I figured, oh great, I'm going to be ahead. And then boom, they came out and there are 16 core uh, processors for servers already. However, good part about this is if I were to get four core units and plug them in here, well, four times eight, mm -hmm. 32, I could have a 32 core system. I could plug GPUs in it. Of course, you know, uh, I wouldn't have a nickel in this. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be all gone. So. Yeah. Do you, remember, do you remember when the machines used to have, go back a few years ago, where you'd be able to do two processors on it? Remember that? They, they, the yeah, board. yeah. You're talking about the CPM machines? They had uh, 6502 and 8088? No, 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 no. You could buy, um, let's say a Pentium 3. You could put two Pentium 3s on the, right. on the net. Right. Yeah. The same thing with Xeon. You could put two Xeon. The right, right. Three, if the motherboard yeah. supports it, supports yes. It right there. And you sometimes wonder, I mean, what is the, what they even said, it, it doesn't work the way you think it's working. Right. Yeah, you know? Well, now you have a, at least some insight as to what's going on. Oh, yeah. it's, it's limited because of the software. If That's it's right. what they refer to as embarrassingly parallel, the problem can be divided up nicely into parts. Then you can send the parts to each of the nodes. It'll then come back. The, the front end will then put the results together and you're ready to go. Uh, it took this thing one second to run that Linpack test. The problem, the problem I see with a lot of the software is that it, it has to have one calculation before it starts with the other one. Sort of, and that, that yeah. gets a little hairy. Well, that's if, if it's something yeah. like the weather, for example. Yeah, yeah. What happens over here affects that's, that's the exactly guys that right. are next to it. You've got to say to yourself, okay, uh, we've got to be able to pass this. This is what I said to you about but if you ever, at, at one time, this is going back 20 years, uh, the first thing that they used to do it, with, with uh, uh, comm side students was at one point they introduced you into uh, uh, you know one of the light like Pascal's and mm -hmm. then they have your right of the things called the, 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 the game of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, one here would also affect something on the other side of the board. Right. 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 That was the whole thing. You know, which is really you know it was a fascinating little subject and that and all of itself. And it sounds like the same thing. I mean, you know, we talk about the weather where you better have to have one. It, I, I don't know if this is just <clears throat> is this idea of parallel cores. You have to have certain types of, exp uh, of calculations or expressions that, that will work on this thing. Exactly, I mean, but the, the problem is they're, yeah. they're being able to sell <clears throat> to the consumer saying, hey, this is a four-core machine, this is an eight-core machine. And some people have the right application for it. That's uh, right. Yeah, that's what right. got me started in thinking about this initially was I came across a uh, fella in Scandinavia, I think Sweden, who built a thing. He referred to it as a Helmer box. He went to IKEA and he bought this Helmer cabinet, which has six drawers in it. And he goes, "This is ideal. I could put six CPUs in this, six motherboards in it. Oh, you know, man. put the power supplies in, and all I got to do is make a back that allows the power supplies to be mounted in another fan." And he organized them in a Z fashion, both, you know, like the power supply, power supply, and then another fan, and a fan, and a fan, to try to get the cooling. Fan and bottom machine was always overheating, and it was heating up more than the rest. Uh, but he made a wall quad core, so he had 24 cores. What was he using it for? Blender. He was, he had a gig, an account with one of the local television stations to make them animations. So it would take him all night to, to try out an animation to see if it was any good. So he's like, this is ridiculous. So he went and bought all this stuff and basically sent all his jobs to these, you know, uh, uh, Blender would have the job broken up, obviously, and he would do one portion here, here, here. So instead of taking all night, it took him 10 to 15 minutes. So he could see what the results were and do another one and do another so one. So the Blender, the program is there? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, it's just yeah. an animation. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. It, it, yeah. it course, might be limits to this, this technique. I mean, yeah. it seems to be. 
Well, like I said, you've got one machine in China that's $3 million, you've got another one in California. Yeah, that's a million specific, million. I guarantee you, it's right. a specific problem. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, they said the one in California, they announced that like two years before and said it was going to be used for uh, discovering information about the aging nuclear stock stockpiles and building better batteries. And those were the applications that they had originally come up with. So uh -huh. what they're doing with it at this point, I'm not sure. But you know, like anything else, the government can tell you one thing. And it seems to be customized. You know, um, I think I remember. I think I remember Atari saying something about parallel processing. Well, they had well, one. They, they, they were working on it. They, were they, did, they had one. Yeah, yeah. They had one. Yeah. The transputer. That's right. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. They had it. They, had it. they never sold it. Well, well they, they did sell them. Okay, not a lot of them, but they did sell them. There's a transcomputer group if you get on the web. Really? Yeah, yeah. Son of a gun. Yeah, they did I only sold a few. I don't know much about it. You didn't hear much about it. Okay, last step. What's in here? I'm going to go for the camera. Mm. Uh, what I did here, uh, in essence, was I wanted it to be relatively easy to try to work on it. Of course, because of the size, it got more and more convoluted and more and more crowded. But what I did was I put two hinges in one corner. And then I have an open section of the front with a, uh, a little hook and eye to hold it closed. Originally, I tried to stap a strap closure, and it couldn't handle the weight, so I had to go to hook and eye. Uh, so here we go. And the way this happened, uh -huh. yeah. it opens up all the way, so you've got a lot of access. It's a convoluted mess because I had to mount, first I mounted the PCs, then I had to go and mount the power supplies, and then because I only had two places basically to mount them, unless I had a, another bracket which would have blocked the fan, I had to go from the bottom and I basically put another bracket and tie wrapped whatever I could to keep these things from wobbling so in the trip it wouldn't... This is generally called the Rube Goldberg <laughs> 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 okay. I don't know how you put it together, Pat, without getting absolutely confused. Yeah. It, it, it's, it seems that way, but uh, like I have, you notice I got numbers near some of these oh, sure motherboards. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I so I started, I think that was the first one, which was labeled number eight, and then I went seven, six, five, four, and then three, two, and then one oh, is underneath here. Right. And five, this is the one that becomes the front end. Right. Okay, because that's one of the, the top ones. Uh, but they have different coolers on them, and I couldn't... Some of these, uh, the Dell ones were a nightmare. Uh, getting everything out of a Dell is a dream. It's easy, except the motherboard and the push button. Oh my god. Okay. The motherboard is mounted to a plate and the only way to reduce the size of this is I had to take, literally destroy the case to get the back plate out because I didn't want to take the processor, I would have to take the processor off to get the board separate because they, they go right through the back of this and it also provides some cooling. So I just took the plates out and I got this huge pair of tin snips that my father had and I cut them down in size a bit and then I mounted them via the plates to the board. Here's one of the ones that does come out, and you notice there's a little green tab here, and this one you just pull, and mm -hmm. it comes out. But unfortunately, some of these guys, uh, you'll notice that it's these little boards that are mounted. This one has a USB and audio. This is part of uh, the board. So that's, of, the base from, that's the base of the, uh, of the PC, from the box. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you can see I've got a tie wrap holding the... Uh, the gigabit networking cards, some of them were half height, some of them were full height. I didn't care, there wasn't going to be any supports anymore. And some of them I bent in order to get them in to run the initial tests. Uh, but one of the first things I did was put the outlets in it. There's no boxes holding them because I knew I was going to be cramped for space. That pin you're using is on the floor now, so be careful. The pin? It's a hat pin or something? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There it is, let me see. Yes, take the up. Uh, yeah. There's something else there that looks like it might have come off, but I don't know. Sort of near your right shoe, your toes pointing at it. Yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah. yeah is that just, anything? Wrong. No, it's nothing. No, okay. uh, so again, I bought an 8-port KVM, and I put a, a, a cross piece underneath it to support the weight, and then a, a tie wrap to make sure it would stay in place. Right. Then I mounted this little surge strip to the... Um, that angle piece of wood so that uh, I could have power for this and power for that that would be on all the time because we wanted it to be on there when I started. 
But again, uh, um, the power supplies are all different styles and sizes. But fortunately, all of them have a common couple really of mounting holes. Mm -hmm. So I just got brackets, screwed them in, and screwed, first screwed the brackets to the power supply and then screwed them to the thing and then put an extra bracket here with a tie wrap to hold it down. Uh, but some, like I was saying earlier, the, some of these, they've got these little boards that, like for example here, this is the start button for this machine, right here. But it's connected via a, a ribbon cable that goes to this board, which has a USB thingy on it, and then that goes to the motherboard. So there was no quick way for me to connect directly to the motherboard. So I wound up putting all, both of the, all three of boards in there, and this one I, I soldered across the switch for the push button. So it made it possible to have eight push buttons up front. They don't all work because the switch is not sensitive enough. Yeah, That was a mistake. Uh, uh, but then again, you can see some of these I used uh, the racks to hold the CDs in uh, wherever I could. So it, it made for an interesting number of evenings. And it was a lot to do. And as it got time went on, I'm going, if I knew it was going to be like this, I wouldn't have dove into this the way I did. But it's done. And like I said, when I get back home, I'll probably be able to get seven of them running again, if not an eighth one. But just, I was, I, I, I said to my girlfriend, I said, Kate, I'd be lucky, you know, if I get two working in the, the front end, because the shaking is probably going to pull stuff apart on me. And it, it appears it had. So, yeah. so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. And that's, uh, I figured for, now this is 30 years for, since Lyog began. And their very first meeting involved seven people, and they discussed the hardware within an Atari 800, and this is the hardware that's to come. So a hardware demo to begin, and a hardware demo kind of to finish it. I don't know if there's going to be any more meetings. It's like I said, I'm, I'm kind of burned out with this one. <laughs> Maybe six months from now, I'm going to have a different feeling about it. It's like, this become an obsession to you? I wanted to get it done because I wanted to do this. Okay, this was important to me. Was guys, you know, this should be something because we need to get back on the cutting edge. And no question about it, this is cutting edge stuff. Parallelism is yeah, where it's going. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, let's see if I can make it happen. And let me tell you, I tried others until I realized that I needed the thin client, which iPixie discs give you the thin client. Once I had that everything started to come together. And I had three machines running, and then five, and then six at one point. And I was like, good, I can start building the box. And of course, as I got into the Dells, it was like, oh! I mean, I have nothing but sheet metal left when I disassemble a Dell, because there's no other way to do it other than break it all up. Especially, these are not too bad, the ones that have the tabs on them. But the rest of them, the ones that are like this, oh my god, it was cut, cut, cut. And here I am with these, oh! you know, with everything I got to cut them. Because I don't have a metal, you know, thing to cut them with. Right. So, and I didn't want to generate any, um, uh, yeah, you know, actually, yeah, piece of metal, metal PD in charge. Yeah. You don't want any of that because gets no. one piece no, gets no, somewhere. No, no. Yeah, that would, that would definitely be a no-no. Right. So, so it had to be done by hand. So, some of these, like the bottom one here, that was out of a Frankenstein, and that was easy. Uh, then. Uh, I think it's that one is an HP and that's uh, a, a little bit newer. When, this, when you first got this thing up, did you scream? It's alive! It's alive! Yeah. No, <laughs> what happened was, I, what's, what's kind of running was, yes, this is good, but I, I've still got other things to do. You know, it's not really finished yet. And you'll notice, like I said, this CD ROMs that I put spaces in there for that they're not filled. But for the demo, I don't need to have them filled. They just have foam to take up the spot. And, oh, the last thing that was causing me a real headache. I pulled all the fans off all the machines. Now, these, these type of processors have a uh, green cowling, and then the fan is mounted just underneath the power supply. So I just took them out. Figured, don't need them. Boot up the BIOS, and it goes, we can't detect the processor fan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So, processor fan... Processor fan, wherever the machine wanted one, I had to put them back. Right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, like, I need to see that. 
Right? That well, was, they needed to see the fan. Yeah, they needed to yeah. see the rotation. Rotation. Because they got mm -hmm. a sensor on them. So I had to put the fans back. I was like, you so and so. I can't run it without it. I can't change the BIOS, you know, unless I reprogram the machine. Which that's not so much of a thing. What? What is this cost you? Well, let's let's go through the list and Fast, start yeah. start adding it up. About $170 for this, about $40 for this. Uh, the cabling figure, that's another $40. Uh, most of it was uh, Cat 6, but some of my Cat 6 cables went bad, so some of these are uh, Cat 5Es that I had. Um, KVM cables, they gave me 6 footers and 12 or 16 footers, they four of each. Well, 16 footers were ridiculous, I have a big coil of wire. Right. I have an older KVM, so I was swatch, swapping cables. So for my older KVM, I've got these huge long cables now. Um, I had to pay for a couple of these machines in the past, so there was about $200 for that. Uh, the box itself figure, that was 100 bucks for all the parts, screws, extra wood, uh, the hinges, and all of that. Uh, so what'd you get? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't fine. Uh, I figured 500 to a grand, maybe. So, it, it, and then of course, you know, things like outlets that bought those, Outlet, yeah. you know, these little things. They got those at the dollar store. Oh, yeah. and, and initially they wouldn't fit together because they got these safety things. So here I am with a big <laughs> pair of snips cutting those little tips off because I didn't want them on there. So this one's got it, but these, you can see they were, they were taken off because they won't fit together. You can't put them in a, a, a socket side by side. So that had to go. So... You know, and then, you know, the stuff like three or four dollars for this stupid little plug. Because it had to be 15 amp, because I knew I was getting up there. You know, you say to yourself, oh my god. You know, and then these wires, this is telephone cable. This was to go from all the push buttons. Push buttons were 250 a piece. There's eight of those. Uh -huh. <laughs> so all these little bits, they start, as the British would go, all these little bits start to get expensive. So you do what you got to do. But like I said, I've had seven of these things running simultaneously at this point. Not eight. I've never gotten eight. But uh, I know from the one that was missing, it was kind of slower. And I was at 1.9 of gigaflops. So that was the theoretical. So I know this thing's pretty close to two gigaflops um, actual. <sighs> Any other questions? Oh, of course, batteries. I've replaced, I've replaced a couple of batteries. I've still got a couple more because these boards, some of them are six, six, seven years old, eight years old. Yeah. And of course, the CMOS batteries start to fail. So you got to oh, yeah. put the, the time in and all this other stuff to get them to remember what's going on every time you boot them up. It's a pain. So I needed batteries. So I bought four at one point. So two of them went in, and I figured out. Oh, Probably get around to the other two. But yeah, yeah, one so, hell of a project. Though, but I started to get tired, you know, and just instead of going around along the wall, I'm like, ah. Yeah, it was a hell of a project. Mm -hmm. Biggest thing I've ever probably done. All right. All right. Any, any last questions? Yeah, what are you going to do with it now? I'm going to try to learn more about MPI. Okay. Okay, and that's using C because I, I went through and learned. Uh, I got two. Other, they came out with a book, uh, Dummy's Guide to C, which didn't cover all the C. So then they came, came out with book two to finish it up. So it was about twelve or fourteen hundred pages, and I finished both of those. So at least I have a good idea about uh, C. MPI has headers, uh, header files. If you know anything about C, that's a connection file of some sort. And so to get the program parallel, you've got to put in these MPI headers and then know how to write the code to make this snippet send to this. What do you mean the header? You're talking about oh, the headers that are of, of different modules you want? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like C, but you know. It's, it's C modules. It's yeah, exactly C modules. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because so, you're programming in C, but the MPI yeah, yeah. has their own headers, so you need what to is have... It? MPI, Message Passing Interface. Oh, okay, all right, I, all right. I said to John, mm -hmm. as, a, as a thing, I said, it's a, it's IPM, which is, you know, like, IPM, you know, but he, I, he's like, what does that mean? And I was like, well, I said, I gave you the letters, but I didn't give you them in the right order. They were backwards. So, <laughs> MPI, mm -hmm. Message Passing Interface. And everybody uses it, even the Chinese. 
it's common to every one of every these, one of these supercomputers. This and the message passing is just, it, it, that's how it communicates. That's these how it controls the nodes. You know, with me. The nodes wait for a command and then they process it and when they're done, it goes back to the, the front end. Yeah, yeah. And then the front end grabs it, you know, and then, okay, I got this data, this data, this starts putting it all together with the programming. And bang, we're done, you know, and then the results will show up. But uh, when this thing checks the speed, it has to use MPI because it's got to send a uh, request. Now, one thing that's common in all of this is the home directory. The one on the front end is common to everybody. So you make a change in the home directory, and that information is available to any node. So if you're working from a node to try to do something, it'll go to the front end's home directory to get that program or whatever it is that you're trying to work from. So Where is that being stored, though? I mean, you Well, you typically have a hard drive on the front end. Okay. Yeah. I didn't need it for this demo. All I needed was to be able to get this thing up as a cluster. and. Uh, so I didn't need to, but what you have to do is basically install the Debian disk to the hard drive, which there are instructions on the web for that. Right. And then you've got something you can change, and then when you get to the RAM 1 thing, it, at that point you tell an HDA 1 or HDA whatever it is for the hard drive, that designation, and it'll go there for the home information. So you still need the CD, uh, well you don't need it, okay, at that point you, need, you won't need it, you just have to tell the program okay, this is where you're going to go get it. And it picks everything else up off the hard drive. Well, I mean, is it dependent on a regular hard drive? Can you do flash memory? Yes, uh, you could put a uh, you could put a thumb drive in it if it's big enough. Oh well, these days, right? Yep. And some of them are. I mean, 32 gig, you could probably do some interesting stuff. Of course, if you're trying to calculate pi to a million places, then uh, that might not hold it. That's the, that's the last WoW demo I've got. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Big. I'm sorry? Big, big, real big. Real big. I'm going to fit in the back of my tiny little car. Uh, have you <laughs> thought about nanotechnology? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, now, now that you brought up that subject, I have one more thing to say about all of this. Uh, uh, like I said, they started coming out with multi-core uh, processors for, uh, for Intel boards. But you've got things like the Raspberry Pi. Well, there's another group that did one of those development things, you know, we need money to develop something. And they sent out these boards at the end of the development process to the people that invested in it. And they have a less populated board for $99, which I believe has 16 cores on it. One what? what kind of one TV? board, about the size of a credit card. It's oh, yeah, yeah, I bought, I which which there, Raspberry Pi Parallella? did you bring? I bought, I bought, what are you doing? Right in back of you. No, I'm talking about Parallella. Oh, no, I don't know. Okay, it's no. brand new. They're selling it for 99 bucks a piece. And supposedly they have 16 cores on it. Wow, on one, on a side? On one card. What, 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 what do you call that one? Like Parallel with an A at the end of it. Parallella. Okay. Parallella. So when I saw that, I was like, who did all this work? <laughs> and for 100 bucks, I could have avoided it. <laughs> That's interesting, Parallel. Yeah. Yeah, Parallel. I saw that on the web. I was like, because you know, I'm doing all this research, even at work, about HPC, and this thing about Parallel shows up, and I was like, oh my god. First boards, they had to have air cooling because they overheated too much because they were 64 core. But I think you can get the 64 core version of it that doesn't have the heating problem. Uh, Probably for three or four hundred dollars, mm -hmm. or you could get four of these sixteen. They have them, they have them stacked. Stacked. Yeah. So if you get this little thing, it's about this big. That it's got sixty-four cores in it. Uh, the best I can do right now with this is if I were to spend five grand or six grand, I could go out and buy eight core processors. Uh, I have to buy the motherboards, of course, and the processors and the memory and all that other happy nonsense. They do come in, uh, this uses uh, the PS2 mm -hmm. type connectors, and you can get a motherboard that will hold a 16-core processor uh, at uh, the computer place uh, with, you know, so it will plug right in here. I can just pull the boards out and put those in. 
but they run about $500 a piece, and so eight of them would be $4,000. And then I could go get some GPUs, which I think they're about four grand a piece. So eight times 4,000, uh, and then eight to double that that quantity of that eight times eight sixty four would be 128 cores. But uh, I don't want to spend that kind of money. I'm sorry, this was enough. Mm -hmm. This was yeah, just wait two enough. years. You'll end up getting that for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this will uh, become the toy box yeah, that it looks box. like, you know, I've been mm -hmm. cutting everything out of it and putting toys in it. I, it, it.